Hi everyone, thanks for coming to Fail is not a four letter word. I am your speaker today. Uh, my name is VM Brasur. I am not a virtual machine. I am an actual person. Um, if uh, you know me live and in person, you also know that the V stands for Vicky, so feel free to call me V, VM, Vicky, whatever you want, um, as long as it's polite. Um, so, really quick introduction to me, because you're not here to learn about me, you're here to learn about failure. Um, I am a technical manager, former programmer, now technical manager. I run software engineering departments, but um, I quit that job a few months ago to start a consulting firm. I run Shoeless Consulting, but really I quit that job because I was asked to write a book. And my book is Translating Business for Tech People. Awesome, more people I know. Um, so I'm writing a book, Business for Tech People, um, in that I started doing some research on a chapter for product management. And I got wondering, well, why do products fail? Why do projects fail? You know, why do you have the new Cokes of the world? What happens there? Uh, so I started researching that and either fell down a rat hole or like a rabbit hole to wonderland and that's really what it was because I did over 1100 pages of reading on the subject um, and have lots of references and notes on that which I will provide both at the uh, end of the talk a link to that and in the wiki if you do not know it every talk at open source bridge has a wiki attached to it if you go to the session page on the right hand side my right hand okay your right hand side on the right hand side there is a link that says session notes just log in there you can uh, write comments whatever it's also where you'll be able to find a link to the slides whenever I'm done here um, so fell down the rat hole did lots of research uh, we're going to start with some nice dramatic examples of failure in modern times um, Part of the reason I do this is because just about every uh, article on research will reference them. These are kind of the pinnacle perfect storms of failure. So, March 28th, 1979, um, Three Mile Island in, I believe it's Pennsylvania, uh, a stuck valve, an ambiguous signal light, and poor training led to what is still one of the worst, if not the worst, nuclear disasters in world history. January 28, 1986, the Challenger shuttle launched. Um, despite advance warnings from engineers, management decided that their concerns about uh, a faulty design with the O2 tanks was going to be okay because it, it wouldn't, nothing bad would happen unless a small subset of things occurred that small subset of things occurred. It was a perfect storm. The Challenger exploded at launch. Closer to home, closer to modern times, one we all know, this is the Deepwater Horizon. April 20th, 2010, um, there was an incorrectly followed cementing procedure. They knew this was happening, but it was quicker, it was easier. They decided to do it anyway. It wouldn't be a problem unless certain things happened. Those certain things were, it allowed gas to escape, which would be fine, except somebody was welding nearby on a windless day. Again, perfect storm, things blew up, people died, worst natural disaster yet in history, as far as we know. Um, so let me give you a few statistics on failures. These are gonna be really business focused. By the way, don't expect to see words. Um, we've got a lot of pictures for you to look at. Um, so uh, these are kind of business focused statistics uh, from my research but from what I can tell they are fairly indicative about projects in general 10% of all American companies disappear each and every year the failure rate among new businesses may be over 90% in the first five years 80% of all new endeavors will fail and disappear within the next five years those that were alive 80% of those are gone. Okay, so failure happens. We have to learn to embrace the learning potential of failure. <laughs> oh, I'm. Yes. Well, I don't know if that was, but my including it was. You know. So failure, we have to learn to embrace it because it's a really effective teacher. Okay, failure teaches you what doesn't work. And at, when you're working at the frontier, it provides invaluable information about what to do next. 
Um, Tim Harford uh, wrote a book called Adapt, and it's about 350 pages of awesomeness about failure. It's just amazing. He has this great quote, which is, make sure you know when you failed or you will never learn. Hey, it, failure is such a key learning opportunity. As we do things throughout life, we gain experiences. Those experiences just happen. It's automatic. Learning from them is not. We have to go out of our way to learn from our experiences. We can't just let them happen to us. We have to take action. So if you do it really correctly, failure provides relatively cheap data with which you can then improve your project, your life, and everything. So we all fail. It is inevitable. It is a fact of existence. Every single failure that you have is going to provide data for you to prevent or minimize the next one down the road. Not learning from this data can be a deadly mistake. Unfortunately, most failures go unreported. This is a problem. Um, the costs of unreported failure are astronomical. You've got money, which we all consider as a cost, but more importantly, you've got time, effort, morale, and goodwill. You're wasting people if you allow failures to go without being reported. So therefore, locating failures should be as well rewarded as locating successes. You need to start failing early. Okay? Uh, if something is starting to die, if it's something is starting to fail, and it is going unreported, there's going to be no amount of money or time that's going to materialize a success and pull a success rabbit out of a failure hat. It's not going to happen. You have to know you're failing. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a dead bunny. Okay? Um, this also causes zombie projects. Okay? They are dead on their legs, but nobody notices. Go. We have to remember that... <laughs> See, this is why my talk runs short. It's for the laugh track. Um, we have to remember that accepting trial and error means we have to accept error. Okay? You don't always have to get it right the first time, but you do have to know what went wrong. Otherwise, you're never going to learn. In addition, you have to understand that failure will happen, and you have to have more than just a plan A. You also have to have an exit strategy, right? You have to plan for failure and be able to get out of it without damaging yourself. It's useful to remember at this point that failure is an absolutely vital part of evolution. Evolution is a constant series of works for now solutions. Okay? But just as these solutions are evolving, the problems they are meant to solve are also evolving. So we have to remember that Things are constantly in flux at all points. Therefore, stay the course equals lack of adaptability. Lack of adaptability in nature is you are dead. So it's very good to be flexible. You have to see what doesn't work. You have to learn from it. You have to move on. Unfortunately, in our culture, this staying the courseness is a valued trait um, uh, pretty much across the board. So, okay. We've got all that introductory crap out of the way. Let's talk about some causes of failure. There are many, obviously. There's as many different causes for failure as there are failures themselves. But they fall into more or less two categories. The first one is culture. Our culture is hostile to failure. Okay? Mistakes are always hidden rather than face people's wrath. They are afraid to take responsibility for failure. People avoid association with failure rather than do this. Okay. People are overly cautious. <laughs> they are overly cautious and they are risk averse. Underperformance is not reported. Okay, I wanted to wait. <laughs> okay, initial failure, failure can be bad, but the steps taken to fix it are usually worse. Some uh, non-technical examples of that. Anyone gamble? Anyone ever make a really bad bet and then follow it up with a lot of other bets trying to make up for that? That is an example of failure compounding. Rather than taking responsibility for your first bad bet, you just keep making more. This is a bad thing. Another example that unfortunately a lot of people get into. Is <laughs> 
actual photo, um, is payday loans, right? This is a problem. It, exorbitant rates people take out a loan because they're already in trouble and then they have an exorbitant rate and then it just sort of snowballs, right? This is failure compounding upon failure. Um, so people in general, we just don't like to fail, period, dot, end. Part of the reason we don't like to fail is that the urge to point fingers is really strong, right? We love to blame. We don't like to take it. We like to place it for others. No one likes to be at the receiving end of blame. We just don't. It's unpleasant, whether it's actually your fault or not. Um, we fear failure and blame, so we avoid, therefore, asking the questions which might reveal it. To avoid blame, my Doctor Who slide, I got one in. Um, to avoid blame, people remain silent, okay? and many failures, therefore, go completely unreported. And as I mentioned earlier, this can have tremendous and varied costs. So that's one category of, of the large swath of causes for failure, right? Culture. It's a problem. Second, cognitive biases. Our brain software has bugs. Usually it works great, but then there's always those edge cases where things just sort of go pear-shaped, right? Um, these are called cognitive biases. Ca uh, psychologists have cataloged a huge number of these, but there are a few which seem to come up more frequently in, than others where failures are concerned. Um, if you've never seen the Wikipedia page on cognitive biases, I highly recommend it. You're just going to psychoanalyze yourself the entire time. Oh, got that one. Oh, I got that one. You just want a checklist, right? Um, pardon? <laughs> there you go. Um, so uh, these come up frequently. And I'll just list some of the most common ones that come up in failure situation. Um, normalization of deviance. God, I am so guilty of this. We all are. You're checking the log files and you see this thing which comes up all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. But hey, nothing's died yet. I'm just going to ignore that. You keep ignoring it, right? until you can't anymore. This is normalization of deviance. This is a deviant, aberrant behavior that you have turned into a normal thing, a part of life, right? Another good example of this is the check engine li light on your car. There you go. <laughs> exactly, there you go. <laughs> that light works, confirm, check. So um, another, uh, a uh, cognitive bias that hits us a lot is outcome bias, right? If the end result of the entire project is a success, well then naturally the entire process must have been successful. But this is never the case. This is a complex system. Just because you have a successful outcome does not mean all the little pieces along the way worked, right? People say you can't argue with success, but that is a load of crap. You can and you should. Survival bias. Um, this is only learning from good examples, and by good I mean the ones you have on hand, right? Rather than seeking out the larger picture. Cognitive dissonance. This is probably the most famous uh, cognitive bias that people know of. Everyone said, oh, I had a little cognitive dissonance. Um, it's essentially, uh, I'm a smart person who just did a dumb thing, but if I'm smart, then they couldn't have been dumb. It had to have been a smart thing. I just did a smart thing. That's cognitive dissonance. Confirmation bias. <laughs> you only see the things which support your belief. Everything else is sort of filtered out, right? Oh, well, it, we can't be having global warming because look at all the snow, right? That is confirmation bias. Um, project champions are the people who are waving the flag for your project on your team or what have you. They are a common source of this. Uh, what they can do, therefore, is spread both cognitive dissonance and uh, confirmation bias, and they crea create a, collectional, a collective delusional belief, right? They create a cargo cult. So it's really difficult to get around this one sometimes. Treatment effects. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I've got a great audience right here, man. He's my man. He's, uh, so treatment effects. These are actions taken after a decision, whether these actions are intentional or not. But they, uh, that must be Paul next door. Um, they affect uh, the outcome of a decision. Um, and these are essentially self-fulfilling prophecies. I hired this person and they're, they're going to be really great. And so as a manager, you spend a little more time with them than with the other people. And it turns out, yeah, they're really great. 
you accidentally set treatment effects in, but you got a great person out of it, so hey, who cares in this case. Um, <laughs> illusion of control, right? We like to believe we have control of all things. We can just manipulate the world as we see fit. What this does is it leads to an inability for us to separate chance from skill. Um, so we can hopefully now all recognize some of the causes for failure, both, cogni both uh, cultural and cognitive. Right? So let's start talking about some of the ways we can work around these things to prevent, minimize, and learn from failing. And we're going to start with Peter, pa uh, I always say his name wrong, Peter Palchinsky. Um, you don't know this man uh, because he's dead. <laughs> but, um, and the reason he is dead, uh, he is a, uh, was a Russian engineer in the early 1900s. He was born and raised in Siberia, knew the area. He was born in a mining camp. Um, when he became an engineer, the Russian government came to him and they said, Hey, Pete, can you help improve the conditions up in our mining camp? And he's like, sure, I'd love to do that. That's really near and dear to my heart. So he went up there and he did all sorts of research of what you need um, to make things work and to stop the failure. And then the cheeky bastard had the guts to tell the Russian government what they needed to hear, not what they wanted to hear, and surprise, he disappeared. Um, so uh, cognitive biases hadn't really been discovered or labeled at that point, but he intuitively understood them and the human condition. So he came up with a list of three really simple principles um, which could help avoid a lot of cognitive biases and reduce the chance or impact of failure. Here they are. The Palchinsky principles is how they're known. Um, A. Seek out and try new things. B. When trying something new, make it survivable. <laughs> C. Seek out feedback and learn from it. So really, what this lovely Russian engineer did is he invented iterative development. So, these are, are pretty easy and we all understand them, but that's not really getting the rubber to the road and affecting change. Um, we'll take these in the same order that I presented them. I'll start with addressing culture. Uh, so, one way to help failure is to address the problems we have with failure in our culture. You have to shift the culture. I need coffee. I mean, I don't, but I do. Is that obvious? Um, so one way for us to uh, shift the culture is to work to reduce the stigma of failure. Let people know it is okay to make mistakes. Who does not recognize this man? Okay, this is Miles Davis. Do you, who does not recognize the name of Miles Davis? It's okay if you don't. You don't? Okay, good, good, good. Well, I just... Uh, as a trumpet player, I just want everyone to know who Miles is. Um, so uh, we have to let people know that it's okay for them to make mistakes. We cannot punish people for making mistakes, therefore. You can't tell them it's okay and then punish them. You should, however, punish people in cases of gross negligence or repeated incompetence. Not saying you should never punish people because sometimes you just, you gotta get them to stop and Punishment may be the only way. But if it's just a mistake, do not punish them for that because that is counterproductive. So what we should do is we should start rewarding thoughtful reflection and introspection into your projects rather than hiding of and not asking the questions of your project, which might expose failure. We need to start rewarding that. So. What this really does is it creates a tolerance, and this tolerance enables analysis, and this analysis itself enables learning. We therefore must start discouraging analysis-free blame. Right? It's okay to make mistakes. We are encouraging analysis. We are discouraging analysis-free blame. So here's a statistic that was in one of the innumerable studies I read. Um, one researcher went out and asked a ton of CEOs. So of all the failures that have happened in your company, how many are actually blameworthy that you can think of? And they said, eh, about two to five percent. Great, that's quite good. Those people were punished, um, as they probably should be because there was probably gross negligence or something involved. So now that you've told me that, 
what percentage actually were blamed? Where was, which ones were treated as blameworthy? That was 90%. 90% of the projects were treated as blameworthy. Somebody got punished for something which was not necessarily their fault. Oh, damn, I used to picture twice. Um, so we need to start remembering that the what is way more important than the who, right? What happened, not who did it. Stop pointing figures, fingers and figure out what happened. We need to fix the problem and not the symptom. Therefore, we need to learn beyond the superficial. We need to not just scrape the topsoil, but we need to get there and just keep on digging until we hit bedrock. That is the analysis we need to start doing. Um, so culture change requires support at the absolute highest level. And this can be remarkably difficult. If you do not only have your boss, your CEO, um, agreeing that this is necessary to do, but supporting, your culture will not change. Um, so questioning the status quo requires the support of senior leadership, right? If you don't have that, then you're going to end up like Peter Palchinsky, hidden in some ditch somewhere in Russia. Right? So, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it is gothic after all. <laughs> but I'm. <laughs> Thanks for the lead in. <laughs> um, so, uh, support from the top. That's going to lead you to leading by example. Right? That's, you really need them to lead by example. It's going to shelter people from persecution. It is going to celebrate failure rather than celebrate blame. Um, it also leads to rewarding fail early, fail often, which prevents failures from reaching epic levels. So to get support from the top, you need to hit them on the bottom line. Um, and that's always money, right? So money turns managerial heads, money, resources. If you can save these for me and make things better, golly, I'm going to pay attention for some reason. Um, so. If you do plan to start changing culture, you should start by trying to gather some numbers, right? Do a loss report, do ROI report, do profit and loss, you know, try and run some numbers. They don't have to be the most in-depth thing, but if you can just bring it to someone and say, hey, we had this project, I heard early on it was going to fail, we didn't stop it, it took this much longer, that cost us this much money that we just wasted. So if you can just take that and say, and here's how I intend, I expect we could fix it. Let's an idea. Let's work on that. You know, that will help get you support from the top because they will pay attention to that. Um, there's another way you can uh, help foster culture change, and that is through churn and hiring. Hey, hi, Nick. Um, so uh, you can hire people who are not afraid to try and fail, and that can help bolster this spirit of of failure and uh, cooperation. But um, this is really effective, but it also can be dangerous. All right? you, it can lead to groupthink. It can lead to a uh, lack of diversity because you're hiring people just like you. So it's really effective, but you do have to be aware of some of the potential side effects so you can avoid that failure. Um, so another solution for culture change is to start encouraging and rewarding people for reporting problems. In cases of potential failure, silence is not golden. This is the only time you will ever hear me say this, but see, if you see something, say something. It's only time I'm going to agree with that. Um, so uh, you can only answer questions about which you have knowledge, right? You can't deal with things you don't know. So you need to question, you need to explore, and you don't assume. And if you do, you document that assumption, and I'll get that later. Gesundheit. Um, so you need to start changing incentives for people to get them to start sharing fr information freely. This, by the way, is the 1966 Act of July 4th. This is the Freedom of Information Act. It is freely available on Internet Archive. Please go find it. Um, so another solution is we need to stop making mountains out of molehills. Right? You can't treat small failures as big deals because that really misunderstands how complex systems work. However, you, while you can't make them into a big deal, you should pay attention to small problems because these become large ones. All right, so you need to find them and start dealing with them early on. So while finding them after the fact is great and dealing with them after the fact, 
finding them beforehand is even better. And in order to help do that, you can run a postmortem on all of your projects, not just the ones that fail. Right? This will minimize survivor bias. Uh, for instance, if you are running a study of the auto industry, you should not just look at the big three. At its peak, there were approximately 2,000 firms in the auto industry. If you're only studying the big three, look at how big of a hole you have in your data. Now, you can learn a ton from those early failures. Another famous example of minimizing survivor bias, and this one is quite literal. Um, if you only look at the bullet holes on the planes that return when you're looking to strengthen your armor, you don't find the ones that actually kill people on the planes that do not return, right? And this is one of the uh, seminal studies on survivor bias. Some very clever man figured out that, oh, wait, no wonder all that armor isn't working. We're putting it in the wrong places. Um, so you really need to look at the entire picture, right? Look at the successes as well as the failures when you're running your postmortems. What you get, oh, oh, rock on, it worked. That bird survived. This was uh, in March, I believe, at uh, the uh, GP2 Formula One. Um, yeah, what you do by running postmortems on everything is you get to see the near misses. Hey, a near miss, while it might look like a success, outcome bias, hello, um, is also a near fail. Near misses are. F <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Near misses are a failure waiting to happen, and in the industry of failure, this is called a latent error. Um, near misses also contribute to normalization of deviance. I had to look at this thing like three times before I saw what was going on. Um, you don't really see what is right in front of you, right? And that's what a near miss can hide. So there are multiple near misses before every disaster and business crisis, every single one. They're typically ignored at the time they occur. If you postmortem only the failures, you're going to miss these latent errors and you have a disaster waiting to happen. So as I already mentioned, organizational disasters rarely have only one cause. Um, a latent error or a near miss plus an enabling condition equals things don't work out the way you expect. <laughs> That's what my reaction as well. Um, so a near miss is a latent error without an enabling condition. Remember at the uh, Deepwater Horizon, the enabling condition. There was no wind. There was a man who happened to be welding near the actual latent, or the near miss, the latent error, which was the gas leak. Um, so a near miss without a latent error uh, is, uh, or is a latent error without the enabling condition. Once you add the enabling condition, then we all know what you get. <laughs> Does anyone recognize this image? This is Fawn's jump in the shark. So, Enabling conditions are entirely out of your hands. <laughs> okay, you can't do anything about enabling conditions. Remember, illusion of control. You don't have control over everything. Therefore, don't pay attention to the enabling conditions. Recognize if they're there, obviously, and go, hey, it's a windless day. But um, otherwise, focus on the latent errors instead. And you can't do that without the postmortem to find the near misses. Um, because of this, Process-driven decisions and, pro and the like are going to be much better than outcome-driven because outcome-driven, you're going to have survivor bias, right? Um, so always do follow the process. Following the process rather than looking at the outcomes uh, will minimize the effects of enabling conditions. Uh, so do it. Something else you need to do in this process is you need to identify the qualities in your particular project uh, which will separate successes and failures, right? They say you can't compare apples and oranges, but if you never do it, how are you going to tell them apart? <laughs> You're just not. So you should make sure you tell the difference. This is success. This is failure. We have defined this. We know where we're going to go. So another solution... <laughs> 
<laughs> there is no arguing with this statement. <laughs> um, <using> no. <laughs> context. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so, uh, a solution for this, uh, for failures and the like, uh, you should always look at your assumptions up front uh, when you start a project. Uh, don't allow them to become truths. Document and share them with everyone in advance. Because undocumented decisions or assumptions, they do become truth. You're sitting in that meeting and somebody says, well, I guess we could probably get 5,000 new users by the end of the month. Bing! That's not a just what if anymore. In the heads of the people in that room, that becomes the number, right? That is the number. It is now truthiness of a sort. So you have to always document your assumptions up front, uh, revisit them, reassess, share, make sure everybody has this information. So in order to make sure everybody has this information, I recommend that you use simple and familiar tools to track failure conditions. Not just the fails, but the failure conditions when they occur. Encourage people to do this, to come forward and share this information. I recommend doing it with your bug tracker. Buy, create some sort of failure category in your bug tracker and tell everyone, please, when you see something, say something. And again, this is the only time I'm going to do that. I'm, oh, okay. Aside from that last one. Are you switching? There you are. Um, so this allows you to both correct and communicate if you are putting things in a public location like this. If you are communicating, you have to say not just the what or the why, because this will foster true learning and stop cargo culting. This is an actual cargo cult. Information in the wants to be free about your failure. You know, make this failure tracker open to all. If it is only open to a select number of people, and this is going to, people are going to say, no, 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 we don't want people to see how things are going wrong. That reflects so poorly on us. That's a culture change that you've got to fix. Um, but if only certain people see it, that's an organizational silo. And organizational silos disperse responsibility and information and that leads to an increase in latent errors and unreported failures. So these things have to be open. I don't think I have to tell anyone in this room that open is good. Also, these reports cannot go into a black hole. They have to be looked at in order to be effective. You should create teams to process uh, and a process. And pro to process. But a teams and a process to review these and analyze them regularly. Every month, every week, every quarter, every end of every release, whatever it works for you, but it has to be regular like clockwork on that calendar and it can't disappear. Don't put it off. When you're analyzing, you have to get to the actual root cause, right? This will help you avoid fundamental attribution error. It would also help you avoid fixing symptoms rather than problems. Again, don't just dig in the topsoil, keep digging until you hit bedrock. Find the root cause. As you're looking at these, um, you need to look at operation, uh, this one's always hard for me to say for some reason, <laughs> operational deviations from the norm. So look at things that are not quite right, like the, uh, that error message that keeps coming up in your log that you're like, eh, can't be asked. Um, you know, look at these and determine the risk on them. Once you know the risk of your op operational deviation from the norm, there, said it, then you can start making actual informed decisions about them rather than suffer th from normalization of deviance. Once you have informed decisions, you can ha say right there, you know, that log message, honestly, it's not risky in this way. So, not a problem. Um, so we're, we're going to not do anything about that. It's in your bug tracker now. So make sure you write that down. Failure analysis teams should be interdisciplinary. Don't just do all programmers or all managers or all QA people or, or all support folk. No, no, no. Have a little from everyone. Have, bring in an admin. Bring in uh, marketing. Because diverse teams question assumptions. Diverse teams ask smart questions because they all are coming from different backgrounds. Looking at these errors, they're not going to see the same things you are. They're not going to have the same baggage you do. If you're the person who wrote that log message, you're going to have different baggage than a support person who has to deal with it when shit hits the fan. Diverse teams 
can prevent or kill zombie projects. They're going to see this. They're, they, most of them don't have skin in the game. So they're able to call out and say, hey, this, this just isn't working. We define success and failure, and this is falling on the failure end of the scale. During every project, you should have built-in checkpoints for reevaluating assumptions and goals. Anyone recognize this? Checkpoint Charlie in Berlin. Apparently it has flowers. That surprised me. Um, so have checkpoints for every project and look at your assumptions. Are these assumptions still valid? If not, what do we do about it? If they are, great, moving on. Um, so check your assumptions. Review your criteria for success when you looked at your apples and oranges. Um, you know, figure out whether you're on track. And if you're not, why not? Is it something you need to look at? Is it something you need to address? Is it some you need to cut the project? You know, analyze the failures that you have to that point, and then recoup some of your losses by salvaging the bits that work. Uh, this is the Salvage Corps. I believe it was in Brooklyn during World War II. A bunch of boys would go around and collect rubber and steel and metal and the like. Yeah, those probably are bike tubes um, because the army needed lots of rubber. Um, so another really key thing in this that can be incredibly effective is only fund until the next checkpoint. If you're in a project that has funding at all, only fund to the next checkpoint. Don't do the entire thing. Um, this is, makes for a great kind of go, no go, red light, green light situation at that point. Um, it's a great motivator to have people actually do the analysis because you're not going to get paid unless you do. Um, but what it also does is it removes the, um, the prestige of running a big project. And if you do that, then when that big project is failing, the project champion isn't likely to put on blinders and go, la, 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 no, everything's fine because I have a big project and it's really important. You know, if you're only funding to the, each step, then you get rid of that piece of the culture. So bring it all back around, little TLDR. Failure is completely inevitable. Um, it is a great teacher. There are innumerable, that's what this was. I was having a hard time with that one, sorry. Um, there are many cultural and psychological reasons for failure. Failure can be prevented through cultural change joined with smart process. And you need to learn to love it. And if you do, you are going to suffer from an overabundance of success. So uh, this is my bibliography. It will list every single resource I used. There were 1,120 pages of research. Um, I have 120 pages of notes, and you can find them all right there. You don't have to read that 1,100 pages of crap because I just did it for you. Um, this is publicly available. This link will be on the wiki page for this talk. So will these slides, which aren't going to avail you very much because there are a lot of photos, but all these speakers and notes I've been staring at rather than looking at you, they'll be on the slides. Um, Whew! I am on D&D, &D, and that is my building manager for my apartment back in San Francisco. <laughs> Awkward. So, um, my contact information, um, pretty much, you see this anywhere online, that's me. Um, that's why I am VM Resort, not Vicky. Uh, it, it's just stupid easy this way. Uh, email address, I will see it almost immediately. I will reply to it maybe within a week, but you will get a reply if you have a question in there. Um, I would rather receive questions this way than this way, unless it's something that you think I can legitimately answer in 140 characters. I tweet like mad. So there's going to be lots of stuff there uh, if you follow me. Um, and that is about it. Uh, we have, I believe, three and a half minutes. So, uh, is that correct, ma'am? Four. Woo! <laughs> An abundance. <laughs> so, uh, it, questions, comments, concerns, wants, fears, desires. Yes, Josh. Yes. I would just like to ask, um, especially since I noticed that the presentation is very US centric. Yes. Um, and especially in East Asia, where failure is shamed upon 
Then, then, seppuku? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the question from Josh uh, for my lovely recording, hi, lovely recording, um, is this is a very U.S.-focused talk, which I own because all the research I found was U.S.-based. Um, and different cultures deal with failure in different ways. Example, sometimes seppuku in Japanese culture. How can people deal with that? Is there a better way to do it? And yeah, there is. But at something cultural, why do you have to start small? Right, you have to. It, you're never going to be able to change an entire culture. I can't make all of America think one way, unfortunately. But um, so just start with your individual project. You know, just the little team that you're on, and start. Always start small. Um, I firmly believe in uh, as as a manager. Uh, I have to manage teams and do lots of stuff, and sometimes you have to just sort of inflict change. But what I prefer is evolution rather than revolution. Start small and then integrate it and iterate it. And, and get little things to help move you slowly towards where you want to go. And again, there is the uh, changing via churn and, and hiring, which is a little difficult in other cultures, potentially. Um, but that's, that's a great question and I had not noticed until this point that every single study was done either in the UK or in America. So that thanks for pointing that out. Yes, sir. Uh, small, viruses. <laughs> viruses are a little too small. <laughs> um, that was the comment. So start small. Viruses are small. Yes, dear. Yes, yes. Um, I'll, so the question is, are there any good examples of people making this work? And there were. Some of the best examples end up being in pharmaceuticals because it costs so damn much to get a successful drug out the door and it can take years and years and years just to figure out that, oh, nuts, it doesn't work. So there, uh, I forget which pharmaceutical industry or company it was, really big place, split off a tiny kind of like strike force. Okay, you're going, here are these chemicals which may or may not have promise for some endeavor. Go, high speed, low drag, get in, get out, see which ones are most likely to work, and then we will see whether those are worthy to give to the real team. And that just did amazing things for them. They saved quite literally billions of dollars. And that's kind of, <laughs> again, turns heads. Eric. Right. That, uh, so Eric's point is a great one um, and really common in programmers. You are not your code. Don't take it personally if somebody finds a bug or a problem in your code. And that, again, he, as he points out correctly, that's a cultural thing which we need to work on. We need to embrace change. We need to make it okay to make mistakes. And just don't get bent out of shape if somebody finds a problem in something you did. It happens. We're all human. I'm human. You're human. Um, I'm, again, as I pointed out, not a virtual machine. We are almost two minutes over. We are going to stop now. Um, so I'm available around for about another hour if you have questions, and I'm available online. So thanks, all.